Jenna Pedersen. I'm on the board of Ministar, so that's why I'm standing up right here right now. I'm here to introduce Abby Allen. She has the next talk. This is, okay, this is her first talk up on stage, and I just want to welcome her. Come on up. She is going to talk about uh, parenting makes me a better product manager. But before she gives her talk, we're going to do a stage selfie because we haven't done one of these in a while, and I want to make sure we get all of you in here. So hang on just a moment. Let's see. i got to be on this side. Okay. Oops. <laughs> this, this, what this is what happens. Okay, here we go. One, two, three. Thank you. All right, you're good to go. All right, thank you everybody for giving me the opportunity to talk today. If I uh, push the button, does it come up? Hmm? Not yet, not yet. There we go. Uh, my name is Abby Allen. I am a product manager at Dispatch and this is my family. There's my husband, Carl, who's sitting right there. Uh, we've been married for about 11 years, and we met at the University of Minnesota in the computer science program in formal languages and automata theory. You know, really romantic class there. <laughs> There's his little sister, Indigo. She moved in with us when she was 16, and she is currently studying at St. Cloud State to be a graphic designer. This is our daughter, Greta. She's four, and an absolute joy and just into literally everything. And then there's me. I have used this description of myself on my LinkedIn profile since before the pandemic, and I will be fully transparent, I didn't think much about it at all when I put it together. It was like the cool thing to put this list of nouns, right? So I just did it. And I didn't think much about it until I had a recruiter reach out, and she called me brave because of one specific word, mom. I've thought a lot about that comment in the years since as I've gone through the ups and downs of being a parent, and I've often wondered, like, why? Like, why did somebody call me brave just for saying in a public place that I'm a mom? And as I've thought more about it, I think it's because there's so much stigma in this country about being a working parent. Back in 2014, the Pew Research Center did a survey and found that 60% of Americans still thought that kids were better off if they had a parent at home. Only about a third thought it was okay to have two working parents. Yet that doesn't match the reality of our workforce today. 46% of two parent households have two parents that are working full time and an additional 23%, one is working part-time and the other is working full-time. Working parents are constantly being bombarded with these messages that if only we set a stricter schedule, we capitalize on nap time, or my favorite in the lower left-hand corner, which might be hard to read, stop putting your child's needs ahead of your own. If you do that, then you too can find gratitude amidst the exhausting, depressing role of parenthood. I tried putting my own needs ahead of my child's and capitalizing on nap time at the beginning of the pandemic, put her down for a nap and hopped on a call with the most senior leaders of my company. I had to stop early and excuse myself because I heard Greta call from upstairs, Mommy, this tastes yucky go running upstairs, and I find that my child has stripped naked and finger-painted her entire body and the walls all around her bed with poop. There are little, tiny, poopy footprints all the way across the carpet from her bed to the baby gate where she met me with a literal shit-eating grin. <laughs> Parenting while working is hard, and it's always been hard. Back in 2014 already, Care.com found that working moms were crying alone at least once a week. Think about that. 25% of moms cry alone. And the pandemic has only made it harder. 66% of parents surveyed by, by Care.com in 2020 said they felt their productivity was suffering because they were juggling childcare responsibilities and work. 54% felt that they were letting down their colleagues. And another 52% said 
that they felt like they had to hide their childcare concerns because their employers or their colleagues wouldn't understand. One of my favorite, favorite writers and activists, her name is Glennon Doyle. She talks a lot about how society gives us these memos that we can choose to accept or throw away. These memos include things like, men must be manly, right? Or girls are bad at math. I think that today it's time for us to throw away the memo that society tells us that we should be guilty for feeling, or that we should feel guilty about being working parents. We are not bad parents because we work, and we are not bad employees because we are parents. We just work in a system that doesn't support us as well as it could. There are so many research studies and anecdotes that talk about this. They say everything from working parents are more productive, they're more creative, and our kids are better ready for school. But there's one I want to focus on because it's really near and dear to my heart. It was done by Kathleen McGlynn at the Harvard Business School back in 2015, and she looked at working women across 24 different countries, and what she found was universal. If you had a woman whose mom also worked outside the home, that woman was more likely to have a job, to be a manager at that job, and to earn higher wages than women who didn't have a working mom she concluded that there are very few things that have such a clear effect on gender inequality as being raised by a working mother. When we go to work every day, we set an example for our kids. When they see us pursuing our own professional dreams, it gives them permission to do the same. Kathleen McGuinn goes on to say, there's a lot of parental guilt about having both parents working outside the home but what this research says to us is you're not only helping your family economically and helping yourself professionally and emotionally if you have a job outside of the home that you love, you're also helping your kids. And I fundamentally believe that our kids help us too. When Carl and I made the transition from being two individuals into a team of four, we learned so many lessons about what it means to be a good team member, about how to communicate effectively, about how to have empathy. And I now try to apply these, position, excuse me, these lessons every day into my personal work. The first story I want to tell you about is about the consequences of unclear communication. This summer, pandemic felt like maybe it was going away. Carl and I were out running errands with Greta and we really needed some cheddar biscuits in our life. So we decided we were gonna go to Red Lobster. Greta pipes up from the back seat, we're going to dead lobster? Why are we gonna see a dead lobster? Okay, whatever kiddo, right? We get to the restaurant, we park, we walk in the restaurant, and Greta sees that tank of lobsters her eyes wide, she goes running up and yells loudly for the entire restaurant to hear, Mommy, you said the lobsters were dead! <laughs> but the piece de resistance, we then you know, get to our, our table, waitress takes our order, comes back and checks on us, and Greta looks up at her and sincerely asks, Are you the one who kills the lobsters? <laughs> So a series of embarrassing events, all because of one piece of unclear communication. As a PM, I write a ton of requirements, and I have learned that it's often more important to specify what's not in scope than what's in. This was illustrated perfectly when I sent Carl and our daughter to the grocery store to buy cookies for a camping trip. This is what they came home with. I couldn't fit it all in my car. <laughs> Speaking of cookies, I love to bake with Greta. And I think there are very few things that illustrate this idea that some things just take as long as they're going to take. And there's not much we can do to speed them up. Right? I can't bake cookies at a higher temperature and expect to get the same quality result. I can't put another oven in my home because it doesn't fit 
or the time it would take me to go buy that oven and install it. I could have baked the damn cookies myself, right? Like, some things you just can't throw more resources at to get a better result. Just like we can't throw people, more people at a dev problem and expect something to be done even faster. Interacting with Greta and the things that are marketed towards children reminds me about the importance of prioritizing things that will delight our users. There is no reason a toothbrush needs to have an LED light and a countdown timer to tell you how long to brush your teeth. But let me tell you, it makes it so much easier to get that child to brush her teeth because it's there. The toothbrushes and so much else that Greta does and, and has really brings home this point about the difference between minimum viable products and minimum lovable products. Greta recently turned four, and we were planning her birthday party, and she saw cake pops on my Pinterest feed. She insisted she had to have cake pops. I'm a relatively thrifty DIY mom. Okay, we'll figure this out. I can make a cake pop. So I go to the store and I'm looking around. I'm like, what am I going to make these cake pops out of? Oh, well, donut holes are about the right size. They're about the right shape. I can buy a package of these and go to Michael's and get some sticks and some dipping chocolate and the most expensive sprinkles and well, well this will work out, right? Yeah, no. <laughs> it had all the right components to be a cake pop, but these things looked awful and they tasted worse. There was something about the process of dipping these things in this melting chocolate that turned them into stale, crumbly, inedible messes. If I had served these cake pops to Greta's grandmother, who's never had a cake pop in her life, I wouldn't have learned if she liked cake pops. I only would have learned she didn't like whatever the heck this was. <laughs> and it reminded me of an article that I love that features Jana Zhang, who's a professor at Stanford, who talks a lot about don't serve burnt pizza. Don't give your users an inferior version of the product and the vision that you have. That's not a good way to learn if you have product market fit. It doesn't help you learn if your product is actually going to solve your users' problems. It just tells you they don't like what you've served them. That said, there's still value in this failure. I learned a ton about the process of actually dipping these things, about what was going to help them stay on the sticks. And eventually, I came up with something that was both beautiful and tasty, and grandma approved. Minimum lovable products are so important because we've only got one shot at a user's first impression. So we want to make sure it's something that they want to come back to again and again and again. It's really hard to overcome a bad first impression. My child has never eaten sand again after this first time, right? And now you could tell Greta, child, you're doing it wrong, right? Sand is not for eating. Just like we try to look at our users sometimes and say, user, you're doing it wrong. That page was not designed for that. That button wasn't designed to be clicked at this point in time. But it doesn't matter what it is we're doing. Our users will always find unexpected ways to use our products. Sometimes it's because they just have radically different preferences than we do. I personally would never use Christmas garland as a scarf, but indigo sure as hell is rocking it, right? Like, Sometimes it's because what we as product developers and designers think is a universal experience doesn't exist at all. You know, bringing in a teenager into our home who we didn't think was that much younger than us, she had a radically different childhood. And there is nothing more like, humbling than realizing that what you think is this universal experience isn't. And trust me, a snarky teenager is the best one to tell you that. <laughs> Indigo also um, has very different ideas about what is essential. And so often our users do too. So we took Indigo camping about six weeks after she moved in with us. And when I go camping, I'm pretty minimalist, right? We were out in the woods, we were in Door County, Wisconsin. And Indigo decided to wear really adorable little dress boots and a cute dress that exposed all of her legs to all of the mosquitoes and brought more technology along than I think we had on the lunar lander. I don't think these things are essential, but she clearly did. 
my children have taught me not just lessons about how to build products and what things to build and what our users might expect, but also how to work together as a team. The first lesson I want to talk about is that you can't build trust within your team without first taking risks. When Indigo moved in with us, it was a struggle. And I think it was a struggle that so many other families with teenagers have around what boundaries do we set for her, right? How much do we let her be online? How late do we let her stay out? Do we lock up our booze, right? Like all of these things that parents of teenagers struggle with. But what we learned by working with Indigo and working with our family therapist is that if you don't give your children opportunities to fail, if you take away that, you also take away their opportunity to succeed. And I think we do this on our teams too, right? We tell our little children that they can be anything they want to be, that anybody can grow up and be the superhero. Yet so often on our teams, we don't let everybody on the team have the chance to succeed. We pile all the hardest work on our most senior people, or we keep it all for ourselves because we don't trust the members of our team. We need to find opportunities to lift everybody up if we want the team to thrive and our product to thrive too. One of the reasons I think that we struggle with this concept is because we don't build enough time in our roadmaps for learning new skills. And that skill could be something technical, it could be a new framework, but it also takes time to learn how to be a team with these particular individuals. Whenever we're working in teams, inevitably conflict is going to arise. In my own house, I've learned to really try and focus in on what are the emotions behind this conflict. With Greta, tantrums are usually because she's either frustrated or disappointed with us. She got scared or surprised. She skinned her knee and she's hurt. And as a mom, whenever I hear that cry, my first fear is that she's injured, right? Luckily, she wasn't this day. Now with my team members, I ask myself the same question. What did I personally do to frustrate or disappoint a team member? Am I acting defensive at work because something left me feeling insecure or took me by surprise? Did a callous comment hurt the feelings of a team member? Or is there a truly critically injured relationship here that needs care right away? Sometimes conflict arises because we just need a break, right? We're tired, we're burnt out, we've been working too hard, none of us are at our best. And it doesn't matter what the reason is or what that emotion is that's fueling it, just like we don't expect our little children to be the bigger person and to step in and be able to solve their own problems all the time, we as leaders on our team also have to be that bigger person and take the first step towards resolution. The last lesson I want to leave you with today is that some things are just more important than work. 2019 was an incredibly challenging year for my family. In January, we had a miscarriage. In February, on Valentine's Day, Indigo was diagnosed with a brain tumor. She had brain surgery two weeks after graduating from high school, went off to school, and then we miscarried again. 2020 was supposed to be our year. Pandemic hit, George Floyd was murdered, and Indigo's brain tumor came back. Never in my professional life before this had I realized how important it was to have a team that saw me as a whole person, who understood that I was working so that I could financially support the things that were going on at home. A team where it was okay to break down in tears in the middle of a work day. When I entered the workforce as a naive 20-something, I thought that the smartest people on the team had to be the ones who were staying up late, fixing that 10 p.m. outage, right? That cowboy coder, he was absolutely the smartest person on the floor. Fast forward a decade and I've realized that the engineers and the product people who take the risks that led to that 10 p.m. outage 
regularly aren't the people who have to rush home at night to make sure that they pick up their kiddo from daycare on time. They might not have a spouse waiting impatiently while dinner is getting cold. I have proactively re-architected solutions with my team so that we didn't need a late night deploy that would put bedtime at risk. We've pushed back the launches of features so that a father in our team could make sure that he didn't have to be glued to his phone during his daughter's last soccer tournament. And you know what? Our users were just as happy with the results. My younger self would have seen these decisions and said, you're not committed to the team. You don't care about our company's vision or about our growth. But now I look at that and I say, my team needs and values flexible schedules. My team needs to be treated like whole people. And I will always advocate for evaluating the risk of an initiative by how it might disrupt family time as well. If you'd asked me 10 years ago if I thought it gets better, if women's rights are human rights, or if Black Lives Matter, I would have told you yes. But my actions wouldn't have matched my words. And I definitely would not have been applying the fundamental principles of equity and inclusion in my day-to-day -day work. But now I know that as a product manager, as a leader on my team, I make decisions every day that impact the lives of real people, like my girls. And if you are on an autonomous team, you have that power to make those decisions too. I'm committed to using technology in a way that makes the world a better place for my girls. One where they truly can grow up to be anything that they want to be. A world that respects their inner beauty and their ferocious tenacity and courage. One that's better not just for them, but for all of their peers. And I hope that today my girls have inspired you to work for a world like that too. Thank you. If you'd like more, I do have a Medium article on this topic. Um, or even better, come work with us. Dispatch is hiring. <laughs>